Hey everyone, this is Joe Minardi. I'm coming to you live from the WVU Emergency Medicine Recording Studios, which just happens to be a dark corner of my 13-year-old's closet. And today, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about using point-of-care ultrasound in patients with shock. When I think about point-of-care ultrasound, I often think of it as a hierarchy of life-saving or life-altering applications. And then I break it down further into more kind of time-saving or cost-saving or convenience applications, which I'm a big fan of. And then kind of separately, I think about procedural applications. Of all of the applications of point-of-care ultrasound that I talk about, using point-of-care ultrasound in patients with undifferentiated shock is right up there at near the top, if not the top, of life-saving applications of which you can apply point-of-care ultrasound. And what I will promise you is if you become fairly skilled and rigorous in your application of employing point-of-care ultrasound in your patients with undifferentiated shock, you will definitely save lives. You will find findings that you would not have otherwise found that will lead you down the right path and will help keep you on the right side of diagnostic error. So what I'm trying to say is that to me, this is one of the most important applications of point-of-care ultrasound that one can master, especially if you work in the emergency department, if you work in the hospital setting, if you work in critical care, and even if you don't necessarily work those settings, having an understanding for how ultrasound helps you evaluate and characterize physiology quickly at the bedside is going to help you expand your understanding of your patients and how you take care of them. So we'll jump in here for the CME purposes. We've got our objectives. And so just real briefly, we're going to you know, find patients where point of care ultrasound will help us improve speed or accuracy and shock, what kind of images we want to look for, and the key findings, and then how do we incorporate that information into the care. And I'll spend a fair amount of time kind of trying to break down my thought processes and how I approach using point of care ultrasound in patients with shock and implementing that information into the rest of the clinical presentation. And that's, that's going to be critically important. And the way I like to approach this is one, and I'll talk a little bit about this, it's not the focus, but we'll talk about you know one, recognizing shock. And remember, shock can sometimes be compensated or a little bit hidden. And how we're going to use history and physical to guide our point of care ultrasound to what may be our most likely or highest diagnostic concerns. So we're not going to do it exactly the same in every person. We're going to have some general things we generally look at, but the history and the physical are going to guide us to where to focus our attention and what to look for when we have patients in shock that's maybe somewhat undifferentiated. And I would even argue patients where we maybe know the source of their shock or why we think they're in shock, characterizing their physiology still informs our management. A patient in septic shock may need a lot of fluid, but if that patient also has underlying cardiac disease, or maybe they have a cardiogenic component as a complication of their septic shock, then that's going to influence the way you manage that patient. So even when you maybe know the etiology of the shock, characterizing physiology more clearly with ultrasound, I think is a beneficial exercise. So characterizing that physiology is going to be critically important. And then in many cases, probably in some literature would suggest around 85, maybe even 90% of cases, we can identify the specific specific etiology of their shock with ultrasound at the bedside before we have any other imaging, any other tests back, or anything at all. And this is something that I find in my practice that just like, and we talk about this in shortness of breath, you walk in the room of a patient in shock, you take a history, you do a physical exam, you apply point of care ultrasound, and you walk out of the room with answers and a clear, direct plan on what you want to do. Much less guessing, much shorter differential diagnosis, and much more confidence in what you want to do. And often quicker decisions on your next management steps, if you have to make decisions on transfer or specialty consultation, some of those things can be made you know, immediately. And the way I like to break this down, and this may be a little bit different than you may have read in some other platforms, and this is just my approach. This is how I like to you know, break it down in a super simple way that I can wrap my simple brain around, is really just four questions that I try to answer. And I might get some more nuance beyond that, but the four questions I try to answer are two questions about their physiology, and then two questions about the etiology of their shock. So the first couple things are, from a physiologic perspective, is it obstructive shock? Obstructive shock is sometimes something that's a little harder to identify. It's often not the more common causes of shock, so sometimes they're easy to forget about. So quickly crossing those off the list or hopefully rapidly identifying if they're there can make a big difference in our patient. This is an area where you're going to save lives when you identify this when it wasn't otherwise suspected. And then is it cardiogenic? So is it cardiogenic shock? One, again, is it pure cardiogenic shock and you need to address that full etiology? 
or is it some other form of shock with another cardiogenic complication or component along with it that's going to influence, you know, instead of slamming six liters of normal saline in this patient, are you going to be a little more cautious or a little more judicious about that management plan? So this is also critically important. And that's it. By default, if you've answer these questions, then you have your management steps laid out for you for the other etiologies of shock. And we'll get into that. And then for specific etiologies, again, these are just questions you need to answer. Is there a source of hemorrhage? Which again, most of the time we think about hemorrhage and trauma, but there are certain sets of atraumatic or non-traumatic hemorrhage, especially now that everybody's on a pixaban these days, that we definitely want to identify. And if we're thinking it there's no way this could be hemorrhage. If you miss that spontaneous bleeding aneurysm in the abdomen or spontaneous spleen rupture and you go down the wrong path, that diagnostic error and delay may lead to mortality or at least significant morbidity of that patient. And then the last thing as far as etiology, if say you've gotten through, you don't think it's obstructive, you don't think it's cardiogenic, a lot of times our default is, well, it's probably septic shock. And why is that? Well, that septic shock is a very common cause of shock and there are all kinds of initiatives from kind of out outside entities that funnel us into thinking about septic shock, which is important in septic shock is, you know, it's necessary for us to recognize it and treat it aggressively and appropriately, but sometimes it gives us a little tunnel vision and we forget about these other sources of shock or other reasons that our patients are sick. But if we do get to the point where we think, okay, it's not obstructive shock, it's not cardiogenic shock, it's not hemorrhagic shock, I think it probably is septic shock and we don't have a clear source, a lot of the times we can find that source with point of care ultrasound. Not all the time, but a lot of times we can, or we can rule things out. So this is how we're going to approach it. Four simple questions. And then the exam is going to be pretty easy. For the most part, we're going to generally start with the heart and the IVC, and that's going to tell us most of our physiology right there. And then we're going to ask ourselves a question. Does this patient have respiratory symptoms or not? If they have respiratory symptoms, then we're going to move into the lungs and look for findings in the lungs that might be either a direct etiology or at least a contributing factor to their shock. If they don't have respiratory symptoms, then we'll go to the abdomen first. And we can look for things like aortic aneurysm, infectious signs, signs of bleeding in the abdomen, but then we'll eventually move back to the lungs because we want to do kind of a reasonable, almost a full body ultrasound in these undifferentiated shock patients, especially the older ones where things can be a little more occult or a little more hidden. We're going to cover most of this and it's a little bit, I often think of this as just a little more detailed, a little more nuanced fast exam. So it looks like a lot when you think, oh, I got to look at all these things. But in reality, it's just a little more detailed fast exam. That's the way I think about it and this is the way I do it. And just like everything else we say this all the time the ultrasound does not have a brain the information that you get from ultrasound does not make decisions on its own you take that information you incorporate it with the other information you have from history physical exam sometimes you have to add in your other you know lab tests imaging and the whole scenario to help you make decisions people run into trouble when they try to say ultrasound showed this so that means this most of the time it doesn't work most of the time and this is true with all imaging the findings add or take away from your differential diagnosis. They often, unless they make a direct, clear diagnosis, they're gonna to add to your diagnostic probabilities and help drive your decisions. And if any of you have done any of my CME content, you know I like to introduce some cases to help illustrate some of the things that we're, we're gonna talk about. So here, we'll talk about a few of these here. Uh, and these are all real cases, either from myself or my colleagues. None of this is phony uh, at all. First case is 76 year old female brought by EMS and had a syncopal episode in the bathroom of her house. She's a little hypotensive en route and she has some left-sided abdominal pain. And here are some of the pictures here. We'll dive into these further as we go through our topic for the day. She's got a history of peptic ulcer disease and recently per a family member had been complaining of ulcer pain. And in our next case, this is a 56 year old male who's short of breath and blood pressures, you know, hypotensive, 84 over 50, heart rate's 86, has a history of congestive heart failure. The patient's mildly somnolent. You hear some crackles on lung exam. You look at the legs, they look to be swollen. So short of breath, crackles, swollen legs. You know, maybe you're thinking CHF and is ultrasound gonna help you differentiate this patient or not? Another patient's a 58-year-old male transferred in for pneumonia, septic shock, so maybe you're receiving this patient in your ICU, and they're on three pressers, a whole bunch of things, and still, still hypotensive, and maybe ultrasound can help you managing this patient and being a little more specific with what you're doing. Next case, 72-year-old female, shows up with acute shortness of breath and hypotension. Lungs are clear, but blood pressure is 68 over 45, and patient's pretty tachycardic. So it's findings that, you know, again, may be helpful. 
In this one, a patient shows up with uh, confusion, a younger patient, hypotensive, heart rate's 130, uh, not getting a lot of history, but maybe ultrasound can help you uh, differentiate this case and give you some more clues about what's going on. Those are our cases. We're going to talk about diving in to using history and physical to guide our point of care ultrasound in patients with shock and asking some very pretty simple questions that are going to help guide us and help us make big leaps in our understanding of our patient's physiology and what may be going on with them.